Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a, an honor to be asked to speak at these programs, but it's an even greater honor to be asked back. <laughs> I guess that says something. And yes, um, as uh, Debbie pointed out, I do live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but today I'm in Evanston. Uh, my life is full of ironies. I grew up here uh, in this area. And then when I was in my 20s, I married and wound up living in Florida for 20 years and then in North Carolina for 20 years. During that time, my daughter attended Northwestern University in Evanston. She married a nice boy from Highland Park. And now we are coming back here frequently, so much so that we have a part-time residence in Evanston. So I think I'm very close to a number of people who are uh, in the program today. Uh, if you know anything about Skokie, you know that it was a very unusual community. I grew up there in the 50s and 60s. I wasn't aware of the fact that it was a community that had about one in six households with at least one Holocaust survivor. I always felt that my family was rather odd because everyone, uh, my, my parents spoke with an accent. I didn't understand why their lives were so full of shadows and sadness. And then only, only to discover much later in life that there were many, many other families in Skokie who were a lot like mine. Uh, Mike said in his introduction that I've been looking for family for more than 50 years. And Mike, I'm going to have to update that biography because tomorrow I turn 70. And in fact, I've been looking for family for more than 60 years, particularly my mother's family. And I'm going to share with you today how I was able to recreate a family tree. When I first started, I only had seven names. Now I have several thousands. And as Mike pointed out, uh, I did a program for your organization last fall that was basically a look at a lot of the Holocaust research resources available, but this is a much more personal story about my journey to reconstruct my family tree. It's called, as you can see, Three Guides for Countries. I presume everybody can see my screen. Is that right? Would you nod your head at me if you can see my screen? And uh, Mike and Debbie were kind enough to give me 90 minutes, but as you might imagine, I'm going to have to talk very, very quickly, and you're going to have to listen very quickly if I'm going to get through all of those villages in Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and a stop in Germany. We may have to leave out Slovakia, but but that's okay. As I mentioned, both of my parents were Holocaust survivors, but they did not come from the same country. My mother was Polish. She came from the second largest city in Poland called Wuj or Ludz, as the Americans call it. And my father was a Hungarian. He came from the first suburb north of the capital city of Budapest. He came from a uh, very modern city called Wipest. They met in a hospital after the war. And had it not been for the Americans liberating my parents from two different work camps, I certainly would not have been born. So I am always very grateful to the Americans who separately brought my mother and father to Frankfurt, uh, rather to Osterrader am Hartz, after the war where they met and where they married. Uh, this is a picture of my parents when they were falling in lust. As I like to say, they were in a DP camp. They were uh, experiencing life again. And thanks to a very generous president, President Truman, who uh, actually had pity upon the uh, displaced persons in Europe after the war, he issued a directive. And my parents got on the first possible, one of the first possible ships to the United States in July 1946. Uh, these are my parents uh, leaning over the ship as it's coming into New York Harbor, a ship called the USS Marine Flasher. And here they are resettled in Minneapolis. As you, many of you know, when the DPs came to New York, it was the policy of Hyas, the Him Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and the Joint to disperse the Jews because there was already plenty of anti-Semitism in New York, as well as in the rest of the country. And the, the thinking then was, let's send these Jews to different uh, places around, around the country. So they wound up in Minneapolis. They are in front of the Jewish sheltering home in that city. And here they they are in their very first apartment, my father looking very Marlon Brando-esque, I think. And you can see my mother's very distinctive handwriting underneath the picture. It says, uh, as she would pronounce it, Minneapolis. 
of the two parents, um, my mother was the one who was shadowed the most by her past. She came from a very large family, uh, which was not unusual back then. She was she had six siblings. Uh, and to the day that my mother died, she believed that she was the sole survivor of her family. This is a picture of my mother uh, wearing the coat that an American liberator gave her in 1945. There was only one picture she had of her family members, and it was this picture of her oldest sister, Rifka, who was born in 1911. Uh, my mother got this uh, photo from a friend of a friend of a friend in Canada. My mother, my mother prized it as though it was a, a jewel. I remember many times coming home from school, finding my mother sitting alone, looking at Look magazine. Some of you remember Look and Life, and occasionally tearing out a picture and showing it to me and saying, You see this person? This person looked like my father or this person looked like my sister. So from a very young age, I was curious about my parents' past and I wanted to try to find out more about what had happened. But as all of you know, prior to the internet, these kinds of searches were very difficult. I have records showing um, a poorly typed letter on my, on my behalf, uh, written to the Red Cross in the 1950s, writing for my mother, looking for what happened to her uh, brothers, what happened to her sisters. And back then, the Red Cross um, didn't have the capability of searching the way it does today. And quite frankly, um, uh, we rarely got any kind of response. My mother hired private attorneys and detectives to look for members of her family. And whenever she traveled, if there was an opportunity to engrave her family name on some kind of memorial wall, she did. She was always concerned when she came to this country and her name had changed, not once, but twice. She married my father and became a Faga monk, and then they changed it again to Mun uh, when I was growing up for fear that the kids would call me a monkey. She was afraid that her family wouldn't be able to find her, so she left little breadcrumbs all over Europe. But to, to the very end, uh, my mother kept on looking for family members, and I kept writing letters. Well, as we started to see the advent of the internet and email, things did become a little bit easier, and I started to discover more resources. And of course, one of the best resources any of us can use are the Arrelson Archives in Germany, as well as the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I knew that my mother had registered herself. I knew that she was registered in Yad Vashem as well. In 2008, my mother was slipping away from us. She was at the Lieberman Center. Many of you are familiar with it in Skokie. And she was facing her last days. My sister and I were sitting in the, in the hospice um, area, um, knowing that the end was going to come. And I opened up my laptop and I noticed a series of emails had come in. And if you take a look at the very top of the screen, I've highlighted in red what I saw sitting in this room very close to where my mother lay dying. And it appeared to be letters from her long lost brother Menachem, from my father who had passed away in 85, from her brother Ephraim in Srulik, when in fact these were emails coming from the Holocaust Museum telling me that they had found information about my mother's family. And these letters came in on the 22nd and the 23rd of May. My mother passed away in the evening of May 23rd. Another thing that was happening in 2008 that really changed in, term, in terms not only of the speed at which information was coming, but also you might remember that we were facing an economic crisis in this country, in fact, a worldwide recession. I teach real estate agents, and when the market collapsed, so did my business. All of a sudden, I'm not teaching as much. I don't have the call for my classes. And I turn behind me in my home office and I go, well, not only am I now uh, less engaged in my full-time work, since my mother has passed, I have more energy. I'm not uh, going up to Chicago every month or every week trying to see my mother and take care of her. Now I have the time to take a look at all of these papers that I've accumulated over the years and try to make some sense of them. So I started to dive 
deeply into genealogy. You know, when I when my friends ask me, you know, why do I do this? It, you know, it's a nice little hobby. I go, no, this isn't a hobby. This is an obsession. And once you start having even the tiniest little bit of success, it becomes like an addiction. So as these emails start to come in and I start to bury myself and go down these rabbit holes and to begin my research in earnest, I discover on the internet that there are now some major resource sites that are that are incredibly helpful. I actually started with Ancestry.com and started dabbling with my husband's side of the family tree first because he's English and any records I would pull up were in English and I could understand them. But as I started to put together his family tree, which goes all the way back to the 1500s, I thought maybe I will be able to make some connections, go across the pond and find the information about my mother and father's family. And lo and behold, I found a website called Jewish Gen. Of course, today, this is where most of our searches, I, I would imagine, would begin if we were uh, studying our Jewish genealogy. But, but back then, this was a brand new resource, at least to me. And of course, today, this is the leading uh, internet genealogical site. I was not very methodical when I first started. Again, I had pieces of paper, some notes I had taken from my mother and my father. I did pull them all together, but I wasn't very organized, much to my regret. So I was kind of using a uh, a shotgun approach, trying every little thing and seeing where it would get me. So when I searched on Jewish Gen and discovered that you could do a search on last name, when I typed in my mother's last name, and thank goodness it wasn't Schwartz or Klein or Goldberg, when I typed in the name Gallus, and this was in January 2009, about six months after my mother passed away, this time, I got a hit. If you'll let your eyes drift to the bottom of the screen, you'll see that there is some kind of microfilm reel existing somewhere that has the names Bluma Gallus and Israel Gallus, born 1915, 1925. Again, it appeared to be some kind of microfilm. So uh, my, my first question was, are these people related to my mother's somehow? Because Bluma and Israel weren't exactly the names I was looking for. So I called my sister Judy, and even though she is younger than I am, she is the repository of my mother's memory. She was the one, my sister was the one who stayed with my mother the longest in the Skokie area. And I said, I know mom had a, a sister by the name of Blumka Sarah, and she had a brother by the name of Srulik, but are, are these two people the same? And what are they doing in Krakow? Because Krakow is south of Ludge. And my sister reminded me that at the beginning of the war, September 1st, 1945, when the Nazis invaded, my mother's oldest sister, Regina, lived in Krakow. And it must have been my grandparents' plan that as, as things became worse, that they would separate the kids in hopes that some of them would survive. Two brothers were sent toward the Russian front where it was thought it might be safer. And a sister by the name of Blumka Sarah and Srulik were sent to live with their older sister in Krakow. So Blumka Sarah was indeed Bluma and Srulik. Well, again, just to show you how ignorant I was about even Jewish names, I didn't know that Srulik was a diminutive for Israel. I didn't even see the connection until somebody said, you know, is Shrail, Shrail, Shrul, Shrul, Shrulik. Shrulik, you know, any, if, you, if, a, if you have Polish Jewish ancestry, you know, it's not uncommon to add a la or an ek at the, some, at the end of somebody's first name to make it kind of a, a, a term of endearment. So, okay, great. I have the right people. This is, these, this is my mother's second sister and youngest brother, but what is in this rec in this database? Well, you'll notice that down at the very bottom of the screen, it says click here for information about this database, which I did. And it turned out that there was this museum of some kind, some archive in Warsaw called the Jewish Historical Institute. And all I had to do was email them. Email, so much better than writing those long letters or typing and sending them out by, by post and usually never getting a response. So I email saying, I'd like to know what's on this microfilm reel. And if there's anything of consequence, I'd be more than happy to pay to receive it. 
I get an answer 24 hours later. And again, to me, that's the speed of light after waiting sometimes for months and years to get any kind of response. And the archivist there was very kind and said, we have some Ludge ghetto identity cards and they may have some photographs attached. And I just swallowed really hard. And I said, and I wrote, I will pay you any amount of money you want. <laughs> if you will FedEx them to me so I can have them right away. And the lady who responded to me said, oh no, there's no charge whatsoever. We're happy to send them to you. You'll have them tomorrow. We'll email them to you. Well, the very next day I was sitting in class and during one of my breaks, I decide to open up my email. And when I do, this is what I see. Just as this lady promised an email from Warsaw with my mother's second sister's work identity card and her picture. Folks, when I saw that picture, first of all, I knew this was my mother's sister. There was no question. The family resemblance was overwhelming. I This was the sister when my mother was dying and barely able to speak English anymore. She would call me Bloom Casera because she believed that I looked like this sister. I was so overwhelmed, I could barely go back to work. But wait, there's more, because there was a second email that came in shortly after this one, and it also had the work identity card of my mother's youngest brother, born in 1925. This is Israel or Sruel Gallus. I called my sister in Wisconsin. I sent her copies. Um, we cried so bitterly. This was such a bittersweet discovery, this artifact, because my mother had only been gone six months. And in that time, I had already found two photographs of her very dear siblings, what my mother would have done to have had these pictures. And again, there's no question that, that I had stumbled upon the right family. Shortly after the Krakow identity cards were indexed by the wonderful volunteers at JRI Poland and Jewish Gen, another database came online for the Ludge Ghetto identity cards. The Ludge Ghetto was the longest running ghetto in Europe during the war. Uh, it had more than 240,000 internees. My mother was there from the beginning to the very end, and she was there with her parents and her middle brother, Menachem. These were the two siblings that were left, and they were tasked by their other siblings with taking care of their mother and father. So I was very hopeful that maybe in this, this database, I'd be able to find pictures of my grandparents, my mother during that time, and my uncle Menachem. And I was very lucky. I did find my uncle Menachem's identity card. And these cards are so robust in terms of their content. They tell you where they were living. It tells you what kind of work they did. And yes, this one had a photograph too. This picture was taken in 1941. So the war had been going on for a year. My uncle still looks relatively healthy. He signed his name rather grandly, M. Gallus. It gives me his date of birth, again, his street, what he did. And then you can see the ominous stamp on top of this identity card. Can you see what I see, which is a transport number? It says transport number 69. Can you see that? Because I was able to follow up again with these these very, this is an incredible community of people on Jewish Gen and JRI Poland. And I sent uh, this information out to the ethernet and a very nice man wrote back and he said, in a way, your uncle was lucky. He wasn't sent to Helmno. He wasn't sent directly to Auschwitz. Auschwitz wasn't um, in full force in 1941. He was transported to Częstochowa. And Częstochowa was the place of a terrible work camp. It was, uh, the place was nicknamed the place of yellow death because the Jews who were enslaved there were using uh, nitric and pyric acid in order to help the Nazis make armaments. So he was one of the lucky ones. Now to my mother's dying day, she believed that her brother died somewhere. Uh, she had no real information. She guessed he might've been in Buchenwald or in Dora, no Dora Nordhausen, but she never mentioned to me that he was in Częstochowa. So it's quite possible she didn't know. This photograph also became very important to me because it explains something that 
I never really understood. As you, some of you may know, and some of you also may be children of survivors, the marriages that were made after the war weren't always very happy marriages. And my parents' marriage was not made in heaven. My parents argued a lot. And eventually, after 20 years of marriage, they divorced. Divorce was very rare among survivors because at least they had their tragedies in common. They came through the fire uh, together. They often had children together. But my parents divorced. And again, it was a passionate marriage, um, but it, it, was, it was filled with a lot of strife and sadness, particularly on my mother's part. So I asked my mother once, well, why did you marry dad? And she said, he brought me chocolate. He made me laugh. And I thought he was the last Jewish boy left on earth. Her mother had told her, marry a Jewish boy, no matter what, marry a Jewish boy. And if you know anything about the history of uh, the post-war period, you know that um, since my parents were liberated in the Osterroder am Harz area of Germany, this was an epicenter of liberation. And there were Poles and Nazis and Russians and Germans and Hungarians, every you know, running all over with no place to go. They were homeless or they were interned in places like Bergen-Belsen for years after the war. So it's quite possible my mother really believed that my father was the last Jewish boy left on earth. But there was something else that was happening here as well. Let's take a closer look at this picture of my mother's brother, Menachem. He was also called Monyek. And now let's take a look at the picture of my father. Do you see what I see? Again, I may be reading too much into this, but I think Menachem and my father have a strong resemblance. And it's not unusual for people to go to the familiar in a marriage. So I think that this, this must have been after my mother's losses. She saw her, she knew that her parents, uh, when they all went to Auschwitz together, that they were immediately taken to the gas chamber. She was left alone. She had been tasked with taking care of her parents. She was always worried after the war what would happen when her siblings came home and she had to tell them that her parents were exterminated at Auschwitz. You know, what would she say to them? But nobody ever came back. So I think when she found my father, she found something that reminded her of her father and it must have been a very powerful draw. Now, on my side of the research, what I'm starting to do is to get a hit of a very powerful drug, and that is discovery of family artifacts. And I know a lot of you have been in hot pursuit, and you've had those moments, those moments of incredible clarity, those highs, where you are getting that information coming together and creating that family narrative that had so many holes in it. In seven months' time, I had now found five, I had five pictures of my mother's family. And I was now hell bent on finding out what happened to the rest. Uh, my mother is is the in the center of this chart. Again, her name was Fega Gallus, but by the time she came to the United States, her name had been had morphed from Fega to Felushka to Fella to Felicia. So she was known by many different names. Her father was Abraham Michal Gallus, and her mother was Hinda Devora. I'm Devora Hinda. Dobzhinsky. I did not have much more than that. I had possibly my mother remembered she thought her her grandfather's name was Ichik, but she did not even know the other side of her family at all. She just knew that the family name was Dobzhinska. So I was determined now that I could see things were coming in more quickly to put this family tree together. I knew that my mother's gala side came from a little village east of Lodge called Yezhov. I had this in my mother's handwriting. I had documented it somewhere. What I didn't know that Yezhov, Poland, is like Springfield in the United States, you know, Springfield, Illinois, Springfield, Massachusetts. So I just went on the internet and found all the different Yezhovs I could find and read, wrote to every single one of them. After all, not only did I have email, I had Google Translate. So I could write in Google Polsky to anybody and make myself pretty much understood. Well, I finally get 
one Polish state ARCOT, PSA in Tomaszow. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. And it appears from talking, from writing to the archivist, that I have found the wellspring of the Gallus family in this Yezhov about a half an hour drive east of Lodz. So I'm corresponding back and forth in Google Polsky. And the archivist says, well, it's going to cost you X amount of money. And then we're going to be mailing you these records. You know, we hope they are what you're looking for. So back then you had to go to a bank and send a wire and it was very expensive but what the heck you know i did it i wanted these records and i wait you know i wait you know I, i've spent all this money and i'm waiting i'm waiting waiting for the mail and so finally i'm very impatient and i wrote to uh, the archivist whose name in polish is rubel mr rubel and of course every time that i put it through google polski it translates his name to mr sparrow OK, so Mr. Sparrow, I sent you my money. You know, it's been a month now. Where exactly are these records that that you have sent to me? And he mails me back in Polish, of course, and I translate it with Google Polski. And it sounds something like this. Stand by your mailbox with calmness. She's arriving shortly, you know. So, all right. So I stood by my mailbox with calmness because presumably these records were ar arriving shortly. and. Eventually they did, and when I opened them up, much to my dismay, they were in yet another language I could not read in Russian. This is Cyrillic, and I'm sure some of you recognize this. You see, my parents raised me to be a very good American. They spoke seven languages between them. They raised me to speak English. Well, I do speak a little bit of Southern English because I lived in Chapel Hill for a while, but it really doesn't count, you know, and I know all the, the major food groups in Hungarian, but, you know, I am in an absolute loss. I never even studied Hebrew. So in the olden days, of course, it would take a long time to find somebody to translate these records, but with the internet is reasonably easy. It didn't take me too long. Plus, some of the other records were actually written in, uh, in Roman, uh, in uh, English alphabet, more or less. So I was able to read those as well. And before I know it, all of these records are coming in that can help me create the Gallus family tree, the one that's in front of you most directly, I want you to be able to take a look at because it turns out this record is going to be very important to me. I just didn't know it at the time. Uh, in, in this uh, record on the left, the, I actually found the household of my mother's father's oldest brother. So this is my great uncle's uh, family. And we're looking at books of residence, which are kind of like census records that the Poles were keeping you know, around the 1920s or so. And here's another entry. This is another entry from a, a book of residence of my grandfather's middle brother, Gallus, Jakob Noach, and again, all of these names were so alien to me, Noach, I've realized later that's Noah, and his wife, Shifra, Ni Litmanovitz, and they had a son by the name of Gallus Leib Mendel, and they had a daughter by the name of Gallus Rose Mariam or Miriam. So with the help of these records, I'm now able to determine just how large my mother's immediate family was. Her great, my great grandfather, her grandfather was Ichik Mayor Gallus, and he had quite a number of children. Again, this was very, I always thought it was just Catholics who had big families, but Jewish families were also enormous. My, my grandfather's oldest brother, Israel Morka, had seven children. My grandfather had seven children. Jacob Noach had four. He'll yeah, Yale Wolf had one. Bluma Feige died in uh, shortly after she was born. Malka had three children. Estasora had two children. Rukla had one. My mother no longer remembered all of the names of her family, but she knew she had many, many cousins. And as I start to assemble this family circle, if you will, I make a promise to myself and to my mother, I am going to find out what happened to all of these people. Now that I know their name, I want to know their fate. Again, my, my family descends from Abraham Michal Gallus, but as you can see, my mother literally had dozens of cousins, and I wanted to find out exactly what happened to them.
So now I had this side of the family tree, but while I am sending away for all of these records, I'm also all over the internet trying to find out about other sides of the family. And I discover that there is this, I knew that there was a cemetery in Lodge that was used during the ghetto, but I didn't realize that it was the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe. And I had no idea that I had family buried there. I started to write to the person who is somewhat the de facto guardian of the Ludge Cemetery. Interestingly enough, his name is Marek Shukalak. Shukalak means searcher. And no, he's not Jewish. Just out of the good, his good nature and his angelic spirit, he was doing his best to uh, take care of the of this of the Jewish cemetery, raise some funds to take care of it. It is a huge place, and at the time that I was there, completely overrun. But all I had asked Mark to do was to tell me, are there any Gallus's or any Dobrzynskis buried in that cemetery? And what I get back from him about a week later just floors me. He actually went to the cemetery and found the graves of my great grandfather, Heim Dobrzynski, and his wife, my great grandmother, Sapora Mindla Dobrzynski. I had no idea because my mother never talked about the losses beyond her own generation. She spoke about her mother, she spoke about her father and her siblings. I didn't know until much later after my mother died that my mother must have remembered these grandparents of hers must have gone to their funerals, must have gone to the cemeteries. When I got these pictures back, something clicked for me. I knew I had to get my feet on the ground. Every time I had mentioned to my mother or my father or my their, their friends who were also all Holocaust survivors that one day I'd like to go back to Europe, they'd all go, why do you want to go back there? All of Europe is one big Jewish cemetery. And they would also say, there's nothing left there. And of course, there was this usual animosity, antipathy towards things German. Why would you ever want to go there? Why would you ever want to eat their food? Why would you want to spend your money there? And I certainly understood that. But I also had this incredible, it was more than curiosity. It was just this burning need to know how did these things happen? And now knowing that from one photograph, I now had five and that there were tombstones of my ancestors, a place for me to mourn my losses, I knew I had to go. I had been in Europe and I had actually gone to Poland back in the, 19, uh, in the early 1980s, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was stumbling around and quite frankly, I found nothing because I went totally unprepared. But this time I was coming back, I was going to go back with knowledge about my family and I was going to get some help unlike the last time I went. So the first person I called since I knew I was going to go to Poland and I didn't speak Polish was Stanley Diamond and nod your head if you know Stanley. Yeah, he's an absolutely critical resource for all things Jewish and Polish. He's been a, a mentor of mine. I consider him an icon for uh, Jewish records indexing. And he knows everybody and everything ab about Jewish Poland. And he said, well, if you're going to go to Poland, then you have to go with my best friend and tour guide there, Krzysztof Malzewiecki. Let's just call him Chris because that's the easier thing to do. And when I did start to make these plans, I found that Chris was the absolute perfect companion for me. Um, like many Poles, when he hands you a business card, he's got numerous part-time jobs. He was He's a tour guide, translator, interpreter, taxi driver, tobacco equipment salesperson. And when I started to plan my trip, as you can see, it wasn't just going to include Poland. I was also going to go to my father's country, Hungary. So I had to find um, a tour guide interpreter there. And I also had to do the same when I was going to go to Germany. So when I landed in Poland, Chris picked me up in Krakow. I was going to go start in the south of Poland and go north to Lodz. Chris picks me up in a truck, uh, kind of a, oh, I would call it kind of a, you know, 
kind of a farmer's truck. I don't know what, how else to put it. And I, I climb in the truck. He says, Debya, that's how we call me. Debya, do you want to drive? Do you want to walk? I know Americans don't like to walk. I said, I'll, I'll do both. I'm happy with both. But I get into his truck because I have to put my bags in there. And uh, I notice he doesn't have any GPS. And we're going to be going to these very small villages all over Poland. And he says to me, Chris don't need no GPS. Chris has emotional GPS, emotional GPS. He always talked about himself in the third person. And I realized he really did because as a tobacco sale, a tobacco equipment salesperson, he was going to these small farming villages and he was just a very friendly guy and he would talk to people and find things out. And that turned out to stand us in very good stead. The first place we went was just almost um, a drive by was my mother's oldest sister's home in Krakow. It was a beautiful home in a beautiful section of Krakow. And we also went to the place where she and her husband and their baby son, Ignace, lived during the ghetto times. Um, they were not in the ghetto very long. Uh, before they decided to leave Krakow when they still could. And they went to uh, Rivka's husband's hometown and they were all murdered in a street action. After we saw Rivka's home, Chris said, let's go to City Hall. I know it's very important for you to get anything with your aunt's signature on it or any information about your little cousin, Ignacy, who had been murdered so brutally. So we go to the Krakow Records office. This is a city, um, city records. And I have the first of several major disappointments. I couldn't speak. To, so Chris had to be my voice. And when he goes in and he asks for these records, the clerk is willing to show him the records, not me. Um, and we're not allowed to take any pictures or to make any copies. But she does have the records of my my aunt's marriage, as well as little Ignazi's birth, and she won't share them with me. I, I see that Chris became very agitated. He was trying everything to get her to uh, just even look at the records, but she kept saying no. And when we left the office empty handed, I asked Chris what the problem was. He says, well, you know, we have privacy laws here. And um, even though you had identification and you had a family tree, you really couldn't prove that you're entitled to look at these records. The records aren't old enough. You're not going to be able to get your hands on them. All I wanted to do was see them. And I, I did have to tell you, and maybe this was paranoia on my part. I had the sense that this woman just didn't like me, that maybe she knew I was Jewish. She sort and like some other Poles that I've met, I believe that she was fearful that I was going to somehow make claims on my relative's property. This was not my intent, but it was just a sense that I have. So Chris said, let's drive to Ludge. Let's go up to your mother's uh, town. I believe we'll have more luck there. And on the way, we did stop at a small synagogue in, I'm sorry, a small cemetery in the town of Jarki. And again, another disappointment, because even though this is, and pardon the pun, a hauntingly beautiful Jewish cemetery, one of the things that saddened me was I might have been walking by the graves of my ancestors and not know it because all of the tombstones were in Hebrew. And unfortunately for me, Chris couldn't read Hebrew either. So I thought, wow, this is the second time I've come to Poland and I'm gonna be walking away with nothing after all of these efforts to get somewhat organized. But I was luckier from that point on. We drove from Krakow, uh, past Jarki, arrived in Ludge. And the first place I wanted to go after a night's sleep was to meet that nice man, Marek Shukalak, who had sent me the pictures of my grandparent, my great grandparents' graves. And Marek with the traditional Polish greeting, strawberries and an office full of smoke because poles still smoke a great deal and you can see that Marek on the left is holding what appears to be some kind of directory he had taken it upon himself to look through whatever records he had in his office and he found a white pages and a yellow pages directory that had the name gallus in it and this was obviously pre-war this was from the 1920s and this was the very first printed artifact I received when I was in Poland. 
And I was just so excited. You know, you wouldn't think that a listing in a white pages could make somebody so happy. But there was my grandfather's name, Gallus Abraham Kupiak, which means merchant, Pomorska 6. That was an address I now had in Ludge. And there's his brother, Hill or Hillel, also a merchant living on Serpnia number six and his other brothers. So I began to realize, wow, my, my grandfather had his brothers around him all doing business in the city of Ludge. And Marek sat down, talked to me through, through Christoph, of course, and he said, you'll definitely want to go to the Polish State Archives, which I was planning on doing. He said, because they're going to have a lot more records. But before I did that, I actually wanted to go to the cemetery itself. And for that, I needed yet another guide, a friend of Chris's by the name of Hubert Rogozinski, speak English, but spoke a little French like I did, and who could read Hebrew. And what Hubert did for me was to take me into the records of what is the Jewish Community Center in Ludge. And even during the worst times in the ghetto, the Jews kept records of people who died and who were buried. And in, uh, unlike other places, in during the war times where Jews were in mass graves, Jews who died in the ghetto were buried in single graves. And while the graves were not marked, they, their location was recorded. And you can see in the middle screen that this is kind of an index card system that was kept during the, uh, during the 40s, which was then turned into the right into a series of books and which now can be found, of course, on the internet. So what we did, Chris and Huber took me through the through this cemetery, which is a remarkable place, these huge tombstones um, of uh, the, uh, the uh, it's just a Jewish cemetery with huge hum uh, tombstones, beautifully great uh, in uh, marked and um, etched. And there's also when you come into the cemetery, a beautiful wall. Uh, around part of the cemetery and people like myself who come back to mourn, to grieve and to commemorate their loved ones when they can't find a grave, uh, they create a plaque which is put up on the wall and it's all along this one side of the cemetery. And as I'm walking along the wall, I can't help but notice the diaspora. You see that the survivors went to Sweden, which surprised me, Jews in Sweden. <laughs> I saw Jews in Australia who came back to Ludge after the war to remember their families. And this was all over that cemetery. And in another place in the cemetery, there are no trees, unlike the older section, which is completely overgrown. You practically have to go through it with a machete. The part that was known as the ghetto field, the area that was used to bury about 40,000 Jews who died during the ghetto, um, that is just grass. There are hardly any trees there. And what you are looking at are markers. Every year, there are members of the Israeli army who come to Poland and have made it their mission to mark all of the graves. I asked Hubert to explain to me, why is the old section of the cemetery so overgrown? And this section has virtually no trees. And Hubert said in broken English, because God wants everyone to see what was what happened here. It was one of many moments on this trip that I felt a chill go through my body. At one point, we finally found the graves of my great grandmother and great grandfather. And we when we were by my great grandfather, I said to Hubert, would you please say a grave? Uh, will you please say a prayer over my great grandmother's grave? And he said to me, I, I can't do this. We need a minion. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, how are you going to find a minion, you know, in the middle of this cemetery? And he looks at me and he he says something in French, which basically means I'll be right back. And he and Chris disappear in the cemetery. It, it, if you've ever seen the movie Field of Dreams, you remember how the baseball players disappear into the corn? Well, that's what happened. Hubert and Chris left me alone. And I'm standing there for 10 minutes at my great grandmother's grave, looking around thinking, if I have to find my way out, I'll never make it. And all of a sudden, out of the corn stalks, if you will, come these 18, 19, and 20 year old boys dressed in white with a Jewish star on their sleeve. And I am sure I am hallucinating. 
I'm positive. I am so stunned at what is happening. They circle me, they circle the grave, they say the prayer, they bow their heads towards me, and then they leave again through the, through the jungle. I couldn't even take out my camera. I couldn't, I couldn't prove to you that this happened. But after they left, I tried to get Chris or Hubert to explain to me who were these young men. And then I figured it out. On my way out, I saw that there was a bus that was being that had been rented by the Israeli army, and this was these were some of the boys who were marking those graves in the um, in the newer section. That was a remarkable experience for me. Very very mystical. The last part of the trip, uh, there are two more parts of the trip in Poland that I want to tell you about before we talk about Hungary, and that is my trip to the archives themselves. Now, again, I'd already had a bad experience with one of the archivists in Krakow. I didn't know what I was going to expect. Chris and I went to the center of town where we, it's just a beautiful square. It's called Liberty Square, Independence Square, and this is very close to where my mother lived. If you look at the map in the center, you can see Pomorska. My mother lived very close uh, to where the archives are. We walked into the archives, um, and this was in the summer. It was very warm. There's no air conditioning. It's a very quiet place, full of dust. And fortunately for me, the archivist I was working with was a very kind woman, and she was very um, more than willing to help find the records of the Gallus and the Dobrzynski people. The records are in these huge leather volumes. When people open up the places where these volumes are kept, you can just smell history come into your face. She is very kind, helping me uh, not only locate the records, but also allowing me to have copies made. And at one point in our conversation, this lady said, I think I have something else that might be of interest to you. And she hands me this book. You can see me here on the left. I'm quite tired. I'm quite warm. Um, after all, I, I'm still jet lagged. And she helps me find the relevant page. She opens up what turns out to be a bona fide yellow pages from the turn of the century in Ludge, and there's my grandfather's name, Abraham Michal A.M. Gallus, who had an office in Ludge on New Street, and it says to me, it says that he is a leather wholesaler, which is totally consistent with what my mother told me that he always wore a leather hat, he made fine leather goods, and that he was always going back and forth to Yezhov, the little ancestral village where there were a lot of cows. I burst into tears looking at a yellow pages. And then I started to jump up and down. I was so excited that everything my mother had told me had been validated by of all things, the yellow pages. And I'm laughing and I'm crying. And one of the other archivists came over. I mean, you have to remember this place is like a library and I'm making quite a scene. Um, and he says to me in his Polish accent, are you an Australian? And I start to laugh. I said, no, why? He says, you jump up, down like kangaroo, like kangaroo, you're like kangaroo. Well, I was pretty darn excited. So I guess to them, yeah, I was like an Australian kangaroo. And this was, again, one of many pieces of paper that I started to accumulate on the, on the trip and put it to my backpack for perusal a little bit later. The final part of the journey in uh, Poland was to go to my grandfather's village, A.M. Gallus. This is apparently where all the Galluses were from. And this was a, a pretty much a dusty little shtetl. You know, when I saw Fiddler on the Roof as a little girl, I thought, what a charming musical, but what does it have to do with me? Well, as it turns out, my grandfather could have been Tevya. He just wasn't a milkman. He was this person who was the local tanner dealing in leather goods. It's Friday afternoon when Chris and I are in his truck riding down the Warsaw Highway, as it's called, towards this little village. And we know we're going to be stopping to ask the, the town records keeper, the clerk, for copies of any records. And I'm a little worried because I know that the, it's summer and the town is going to close up around three o'clock. It's Friday afternoon. Everybody wants to go home. Uh, again, let me just show you where we are in Poland. There's Krakow and Ludge, as you can see on the map. And again, there's Ludge, and we're heading on the Warsaw Highway. It's called the Warsawa Highway. The heading east past Rogov to this little tiny blip of a town called Yezhov. And as we're approaching the town, Chris says to me, Debya, you hungry? Vista, we eat. Zurich, good soup, national soup, national soup Poland. <laughs> 
And I said, Chris, I, you know, I'm really not that hungry. I'm much more anxious to just go to the records office. And this time he said it to me again, only this time it wasn't a question. Debya, you hungry? They stop. We eat good soup, jerk, national soup, Poland. All right, well, he's driving. I don't have much of a choice. And what does he do but pulls into this truck stop, not even a truck stop, in this just outside this little town. And it's not looking very appealing. I'll admit to being a little bit of a snob at truck stops. He's quite insistent. P.S., right? So we pull in. There are two young girls at the counter. He orders Jurek and something else for Jurek, I think it is, it's more properly pronounced. And I can hear that Chris is talking about me with these two young girls, because I can hear them say Angelsku, which basically means somebody who speaks English, like don't bother talking to Debbie, she doesn't know what you're talking about. And then Chris comes back to the table and waits for me. And in a few minutes, the owner of the gas station and his wife come out to greet us. The wife makes the soup, the husband runs the gas station, and they are the wealthiest people in this small little town. And he's, they all both sits down with me, they're fascinated by the history. He speaks, uh, Tadush speaks a little bit of English, and he explains to me that he's been his, in this town. Grand, his grandparents have been in this town. Their cows have been in this town. Probably his grandfather sold, sold cows to my grandfather. And they're very welcoming. They welcome me into in the gas station. And then he does something remarkable. Tadush picks up the phone, and he calls City Hall and says something probably something like there, there's this American woman coming with her guide. I want you to be very nice to her, you know, help her out. I, I couldn't believe how kind they were. Again, I was, I was prepared for a lot of things, but not the kindness of the local polls. Well, Chris and I, short time later, pull up uh, in our truck to the Yezhov City Hall. And again, we meet a clerk who is looking at her watch a lot you know i think she's just kind of not real happy that this american woman is coming in and chris has already warned me he said debbie don't say anything i said okay fine so go into this little tiny office he tells her what we like all of the records of the gallus family that you have going all the way back to the 1800s so pani anna as we called her dear miss anna pani anna opens up this cabinet behind her and the moth the moths practically fly out and there are all these gorgeous leather tomes of the jewish birth marriage and death records and she takes one volume out starting with the most recent in the 1900s pulls one out it's two o'clock in the afternoon and she's taking these big pages and flipping them very slowly in front of me and i just know we're we're not going to get anything and chris is reading my face and he says something somewhat sharp to Pani Anna. And then he goes behind her counter and he pulls out all of the books and she's looking horrified. I'm sure we violated all kinds of privacy laws, but he's not gonna take no for an answer. He puts all the books out on these tables, starting with the 1920s. And he's flipping through them, looking at them very methodically, going through every single page. And finally he stops, he turns to me and he smiles and he says, Debya, Got the bun, got a gallus, got a gallus. And my heart stops. And I turn to Pani Anna, and I know she doesn't understand a word I'm saying, but I say, Pani Anna, I've, I've traveled a long way. I don't want much. I won't take pictures. I don't want, I don't want to make copies. I don't want to cause trouble. But could Chris just turn the book around so I could see the record that he found? Could he just? turn the book around. And she looked at me. She looked at Chris. She looked at me. She looked at Chris and gave an almost imperceptible nod. And Chris turned the book around. And this is what I saw. It was a birth record. And it was the first birth record I'd ever seen that had my mother's father's family name. There's Israel Mortka Gallus, the oldest brother of my on my grandfather's side. And this was the birth of his daughter, Haya Lea Gallus. And at the very bottom of this birth record was my great uncle's signature. This was the first signature, the first personal thing. It wasn't It wasn't a an ad from the yellow pages. It was something that my great uncle had touched and I just burst into tears.
And then I asked for the impossible. I asked Paniana, said, could I please just put my hand where my great uncle's hand was? Can I just touch the page? That's all I want. And I don't know if she understood me or not, but she looked at me and she smiled and she nodded. And of course, the moment I touched that page, the tears started to spring out of my eyes like this. And when Pani Anna saw that, with Chris, going very methodically, looking for all of the Gallus's, and she was leaning over looking at Chris and going something like, you missed one, Chris? And she turned to me and she say, Debya, Debya, and then she went like this. And she started to allow me to take pictures of all of the records of the Gallus family back to 1826. Something happened in that room. I don't know what it was, but it felt like magic. And I know when I came back a year later and wanted to just visit to say hello and to say thank you, I had written her a letter after that visit about how meaningful that experience was and how those documents were. And she had framed my letter and put it on her desk. There were many other very special moments during that trip, but that was something out of this world. I, after Poland, I flew to Hungary and I had found my guide on the internet. He had simply been um, posting some things of interest. And it turned out that he was, my guide was a delightful young man who picked me up at the airport in Budapest. His name is Vandar Karoli. Many of you know him because he's speaking to, uh, spoken to your organization in the, I believe in the synagogue. And Vandor is his last name and it means wanderer. So I had a searcher and a wanderer already. There's, there's Caress that'll help you remember. And of course, one of the things that he wanted to do was to know me a little bit better. So when he picked me up, he asked me what my memories were of my father. And I said, I, I remember Hungarian. I remember some, uh, some Hungarian. I remember um, Meglavesh, cherry soup. I remember uh, the wonderful uh, baked goods um, that my Hungarian grandmother used to make. And, um, and I remember this song that my grand that my father used to sing to me, Botsi, Botsi Tarka, Shefu Leshefarka. And, and Von and, and Caress, his nickname is, smiled and he said, oh, that's kind of a little nursery rhyme, a little lullaby, nobody sings it anymore. So what does it mean? He says, Bosi Bosi is like bossy bossy, it's a song about a little cow. All right, so we, we had a, a nice little chance to get to talk to each other before he started to show me Budapest itself. If you haven't been there, it's like Paris, but better. Bigger portions of food, more, just, just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. And of course, we went to see the Holocaust Memorial there. We looked at a lot of books, the history. And then, of course, Caress took me to my dad's synagogue. Now, I mentioned that I had been to Europe before. Back in 1985, my dad was very, very ill. He was dying of cancer. He never wanted to go back to Hungary, but I begged him. I said, I won't be able to find my way around Hungary. Hungarian is an impossible language to learn. And besides, it'd be a lot more fun if we go back together. And I didn't know a lot about my dad, a religious person. So I was quite surprised to find out that he had been bar mitzvahed at this beautiful set, at this beautiful synagogue. Notice it's in the kind of a Byzantine style or a Moor style, which was very common. And back when we visited this synagogue, it turned out that the synagogue had its own Holocaust memorial. In the inner courtyard, there was a kind of Vietnam wall-like memorial of the 3,000 Jews who had been murdered during the war. And this is a picture of my dad in 1985 pointing to the wall with some degree of irony in his face because my dad is on the wall as one of the dead. You can see his, he's pointing to his name, Tibor, age 19. His father's name is right underneath him. Vilmos died at age 49 in Mauthausen. Now, how did my father's name get up on the wall after the war? Um, he went back to Budapest to look for his family. And when he got off the train, the Red Cross was there. And my father hated anybody in a uniform. He never trusted anyone again after the war. He refused to give his name to the Red Cross because the last time he put his name on a list, he had been deported by the Nazis. Plus they had a cross 
And he thought that the Red Cross had been incredibly stupid and naive during the war. You all read about how they were fooled by what had happened at Theresienstadt. So one of the places I wanted to go back in 2009 was to visit this place I had been with my father. Only this time when I went, and you can see that the wall has been re-etched, I looked more closely. I had only focused on my dad's name and his, and his father's name, but I realized there are some other names here, some other monks here, and maybe they're my monks too. And I made a mental note that Caress and I were going to follow up on that as well um, during our journeys, and I'll tell you how that ended. Here's a picture of Caress. Thank goodness he was younger because he had the energy to scale walls, which we sometimes had to do, and to keep on looking at tombstones even when it was 99 degrees out there. And I have to tell you some of the, some again, the, the more mystical experiences I had, there was, we visited Tokai. Uh, Tokai is kind of in wine country in Hungary and I have some uh, ancestry there. And, and Caress said, do you wanna go see the community center? It used to be a synagogue. Would you like to see it? And I said, absolutely, let's go. It was completely deserted, a beautiful building that had been turned into kind of a community center, if you will, two stories with a balcony and a grand piano on the first floor. We come in, we start to look around, we go upstairs to the balcony where the women used to pray. And a little boy about eight years old comes in, sits down at the piano. And what does he start to play? Botsi, botsi, tarka, shefulesh. I mean, both Caress and I just kind of had a moment there. And later on in the journey as well, we had a incredibly hot weather. The Hungarian cars are generally not air conditioning. No place is generally air conditioned. And we were trying to find a cemetery, a very remote, isolated cemetery. I was at this point exhausted and Caress said, I'll go out, I'll, I'll go and ask some people, see if they know where the cemetery is. Caressa's wife was in the back seat waiting with me. I've just kind of closed my eyes and just trying to get any kind of breath of air. And all of a sudden I start to hear this instrumental song. And I think, okay, I'm hallucinating. I've just lost it. I'm having a stroke, something's going on. And out of the left hand, and I ask, I ask um, Caressa's wife, do you hear that too? And she says, oh yeah, I hear it too. I see an ice cream truck go by. Apparently that's the song, the ice cream trucks sing there. And Caress has come back to the car and I said, I don't know what's going on, but you need to follow that truck. And we followed it a couple blocks. The truck stops, the truck driver, who we cannot see, we can see his arm go out the window and he points to the left and there's the cemetery. Don't ask me to explain it. It's incredible things where I felt my parents were with me. After Hungary, I wanted to go to Germany. And I had never been to Germany before. Again, there was I had a lot of fear about going into Germany, uh, a lot of anxiety. The German language still is very difficult for me to listen to. But I was very fortunate that I was meeting a German archivist there with whom I had developed a friendship uh, oh, by email. I had been writing to all the archivists in the center of Germany to find out if there was any record of my parents' marriage. I knew that they were married in a DP camp. I know they were married by a Jewish chaplain there. There had to be some kind of record. And the one archivist who wrote to me right away and said, I'm sorry, we don't have any records, also said, let me check with some of my friends in the area and see if I can help you. So he kind of took a personal interest. And when I told him I was coming to Germany, he said, let me be your tour guide. And I demurred and said, Rainier, you know, this is your full-time job. I can't possibly ask you to take me personally on a tour. And he was absolutely insistent. I asked my husband, what should I do? I don't want to say no to this fellow, but I feel like I'm really imposing. My husband said, you're crazy. If this guy is willing to take you, you know, an expert in the history of this area, and he's willing to spend time with you, absolutely take him up on his offer, which I eventually did. Although again, there was quite a bit of trepidation flying into Hanover, being picked up by a German man I don't know, and being driven to Bergen-Belsen. So you can imagine how I felt. But as it turns out, Rainier's spoken English, which was as magnificent as his written English, and he spoke with a British accent. So I was beginning to feel a little bit more comfortable. His name again was Rainier Voss, and the first stop was going to be to Bergen-Belsen, where my mother had been taken 
right after Auschwitz. My mother went with her parents um, in August of 44 from the Ludge ghetto to Auschwitz where her parents were exterminated. She was in Auschwitz for about a month before she was selected to go with um, a group of thousand, uh, about a, several thousand Jewish women to Bergen-Belsen. And Bergen-Belsen was the first place that we were going to stop. And again, I was very fortunate that Rainier introduced me to this young man who is basically the director of the Bergen-Belsen um, Bergen-Belsen Memorial. Bergen-Belsen, the museum itself, the memorial, is not on the grounds of Bergen-Belsen. The Germans consider that sacred ground. They will not build on it. Instead, part of the museum and the memorial hangs over the grounds but doesn't touch it. I know that there are a lot of people in my family and perhaps in the audience today who would never set foot in Germany, but I have to tell you that of all the countries in Europe, Germany is the one that has done the most work in terms of memory work commemoration. And they perhaps are the ones who are most repelled by their own history, but they have been in recent years very brave about how they have confronted history. There isn't a town I've been in in Germany that doesn't have some kind of Holocaust memorial and ones where I, you know, I've seen children being educated by their teachers about what happened here. And, and the historian Berndt was incredibly interested in my mother's experience in Bergen-Belsen. A lot of the records were burned down because when the uh, British liberated Bergen-Belsen, it was so rife with disease that they had to burn down the barracks. My mother said that in some case, in some ways, Bergen-Belsen was worse than Auschwitz because there was no work, there was no food, and people were just dying there. That was their job. It was basically to die. Um, I did walk out on the grounds where I knew that my mother was in what was called a tent field. By the time my mother arrived there, there was no space. In so the Nazis had the women take basically rags and sheets and build tents. And when my mother was there, there was a terrible storm at the end of October, November, where a big wind blew all of these sheets down and the women were totally exposed to the elements. And my mother had some comments in her diary about what had happened there. And of course, Bernd wanted a copy of the diary, which was I was happy to send him. There, there, there is a monument um, to Anne Frank there and to her sister. Nobody knows where their real burial place is, but you can go there and see that. Bergen-Belsen is in a rather remote place, so you do have to have somebody take you out there or to have a car. And it is a very, very sad and haunted place. I had reasonably good weather during my entire trip um, when I was in Europe. But on this one day, as I went out of the museum, followed by Bernd and Rainier, it started to rain. And I turned to Rainier and to Bernd, and I said, would you like to share my umbrella? Because they were totally unsheltered. And Rainier turned to me and said, everything is okay, don't worry about me, which is exactly what my mother used to say to me. Don't worry about me, everything is okay. And then all of a sudden, the clouds cleared and a rainbow came out. And I almost felt like turning up to the heavens and saying, mom, I get it. I get it. You think I'm you know, going a little bit out of control here, but I do get it. From there, we went to the place where, uh, the last place where my father was during the war. He was enslaved at Dora Nordhausen. This is where the Nazis had the enslaved peoples inside a mountain building the V2 rockets that were supposed to be launched uh, against London, only there, there were more people who died in the tunnels from the work than there were from people who died from the V2 rockets. And just an interesting note about what went on in those tunnels. Some of you remember Werner von Braun. After the war, the Americans brought him to the United States to run our rocket science department. That's why, you know, he was taken. And of course, um, to, his, to his dying day, uh, Werner von Braun said he was never a Nazi. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, living in Skokie, we had a black and white television and there was a big program going on about Werner von Braun getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And my father was entranced by what he saw in front of the television. And he was yelling at the television. And he was saying, why do they keep saying 
that he was NASA. He was NASA. He was a Nazi. He was a Nazi. He was there. I said, no, Dad, not N-A-S-A. -A. That's not Nazi. That's National Aeronautics Space Administration. He said he was a Nazi. He was there. He was stepping over bodies. And there has been some evidence that has come to light later that indeed Werner von Braun was working for the Nazis, um, developing, of course, the rockets that were going to be launched, presumably from this area. The only sabotage the men there could possibly do would be to, you know, put some, my father said the sabotage, you know, if you sabotage the rockets, you would be killed for that. But they were able sometimes to stop the rockets from working. My father became very ill. This was March, April of 1944. It's towards the end of the war. And he was taken with 1600 other very sick inmates uh, to a sub camp of Dora Nordhausen called the, uh, the barracks concern, the Belka concern and left to die. Basically, even the Nazis didn't care about them anymore. They put some barbed wire around these barracks and left the men with no food to die. And they went into the mountains because the Americans were starting to bomb uh, Dora Nordhausen. When the Americans finally arrived, they got to Belka Kasern first, where my father was. And in some of the liberators' diaries, they wrote that all they saw were 1,500 skeletons, and then some of the skeletons started to move. And one of them was my dad. Not too far away, my mother was in the last camp she was going to be in, in, in Salzfadel. Uh, this is a bucolic little town. And the only thing that is left, there's no um, big museum like there is in Bergen-Belsen or Nord Dorn Nordhausen. There is a, uh, a monument, if you will, and a plaque that was put up by the women who were in this camp. So you can, you can find some memorial there, but it's relatively small. Now from these two camps from Dora Nordhausen and, and from Salzfadel, the Americans had taken the sickest of the inmates to a hospital in an area called Osterotter um, Hearts, a heart, the Hearts Mountains, where some of you um, no doubt have heard or have been. And it is a beautiful place. It looks a lot like the Appalachian Mar Mountains of North Carolina. And they were taken to an American hospital that was actually a German military hospital taken over by the liberators. And there they nursed my mother and father back to health. Again, it's a beautiful area of Germany. But um, I think my mother would tell you, um, as she wrote in her diary, that it is hard to believe that you can go to such a beautiful area where such evil had taken place. And I know she would find some relief if I told her the hospital is gone, but evil still exists because there's a McDonald's in its place. So, you know, I came back from this trip totally imbued with this sense of family, but with a huge backpack of records. And ironically, at the time I came back, I read about this organization called the International Association of Jewish Genealogists. And they apparently were having an annual meeting in Philadelphia that summer. And I noticed on the agenda that the last Friday of the meeting, they were going to have Megan Lewis and Joe Ellen Decker from Memorial Museum. And I thought, well, what the heck, from Raleigh to Philadelphia, I could take a train up there. You know, I think I know everything by now. I was pretty smug. I'll just, you know, I'll just go up there and see if I could learn anything else. Well, I was needless to say astounded by what I learned, but the opportunity to meet with Megan and Joe Ellen privately for 20 minutes was life changing. I sat down with them. It turned out that they had brought their own computer, which had their own database, stuff that wasn't online yet. And they said, would you like us to see if we can find anything about the Gallus family? I said, well, you know, I think I've got everything, but sure, you go right ahead. And in two minutes, Joe Ellen said to me, is there a Jacob Gallus in your family? And again, it'd been now a couple months since I had seen those initial records. And I said, well, that really sounds familiar. She says, well, apparently there, Jacob Gallus's name appears somewhere in Sweden on a Stockholm Memorial wall. And I thought I, it, it, I was listening to the title of a Mel Brooks movie, Jews in Sweden. I mean, I didn't know anything. And she, she said, yes, you know, quite a number of Jews were taken in after the war by Sweden. She said, is it possible Jacob Gallus could be um, a relative. And she said, there's something else here in the database. Apparently somebody else on the wall is Shimon and Rose Marie Gallus. What none of us knew at that time was that in 
in the out, the outside of the Stockholm synagogue, yes, there's a large synagogue in Stockholm, was another memorial wall. And somebody had written down all of the names and put them into a spreadsheet, which Megan and Joellen had. What we didn't know was that there was a stone that looked like this. Galus Jacob, Galus Shifra, Galus Mendel, Galus Moses. Galus Shimon Akronsky, formerly Galus Rosemary. And I felt a heat from my body. This was again a Friday afternoon. I said, I've got to go home and get those records because it appears that that somebody survived from my mother's family, that Jacob and Shifra and maybe Mendel and Moses died, but somebody else has left their name on the wall. And these possibly could be cousins of mine. Remember now, I descend from Abraham Machal Gallus. That was my grandfather. But he had an older brother by the name of Israel, and he had a middle brother by the name of Jacob, who had four children. And now let's go back to that record I showed you about 45 minutes ago. When I got back to Raleigh, it was about six o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and I frantically start to dig through those records, and I start to see those names match up. Jacob Gallus, Shifra Gallus, Le Mendel Gallus, and Moses Gallus. And I start to feel this rising sense that I'm on the cusp of this amazing discovery. And I start to write to Stockholm, to the synagogue, to the rabbi. You know, I'm on the internet trying to find anybody who might be able to help me. Now, it's Friday night, so it's Shabbat in the United States. It's Saturday, it is Shabbat, uh, you know, in Sweden, it's also August, and all the Swedes leave and go to the North Pole or wherever it is they like to go. So nobody is returning my calls. And I am on pins and needles because I'm thinking I'm about to talk to a first or second cousin. I never had a first or second cousin. My mother believed that no one survived from her family. Well, finally, again, you put something out into the internet universe, I get an email from this man who I do not know. His name is Professor Olson. He teaches at the University of Uppsala. And he said, I saw your posting. He said, I, I hope you don't mind, but I uh, took the liberty of following your trail to see if I could find out anything at all about Jacob and about Shifra. So again, just to help you put this into perspective, my grandparents were Abram, Michal, and Hinda. They had, among other children, Fega, my mother, and here's me and my sister, Jacob and Shifra. Jacob was Abram's brother. They had four children, Mendel and Moses, who we know died during the war, but apparently Shimon and Rosemary had survived. Rosemary had, had married a fellow by the name of Haim Goronsky. So I said, oh my God, my mother had two first cousins that survived. But as Professor Olson explained it to me, he said, I'm, I'm, he said, I'm so sad to tell you this. It's true. They did survive. But Simone died in 1997. And Rosemary died in 1998. I had been in Sweden in 1994. Sometimes our work is quite bittersweet. I had made this incredible discovery that my mother had first cousins. She would have found so much comfort in knowing that anybody from her family had survived. But then Professor Olson said one more thing. He said, don't despair. I can give you some good news. Simone had a son by the name of Jacques, named after Jacob, clearly. And Rosemary had two children, Yossi, also named after Jacob, and a daughter by the name of Sylvia. And they're all well, and they're living in Stockholm. Would you like their phone numbers? Would I? <laughs> so the first person... I try to reach, just randomly, I try to reach Yossi, Joseph. And Yossi has, and it's in Sweden. I have no idea whether these people understand my message or not. But here's what I said to, what I left in the message to Yossi. Yossi, this, you don't know me. I'm your cousin, Debbie. I've been looking for you all of my life. Would you please call me? Your mother was Rosemary. Her father was Jacob. Jacob was my grandfather's brother. Here's my phone number. Here's my email. Here's my Twitter handle. Here's my Facebook. And I just left him this long message. And I realized after I hung up that I sounded like an absolute mad, mad woman. My husband was listening to some of these phone calls and he said, 
people. These people are going to think you're crazy. They're never going to call you back. And I said, I, I've been looking for these people for 15 years. I'm not going to chill. So I decided what I was going to do after waiting for 24 hours for Yossi to call me back was call his sister, Sylvia. Well, it turned out the phone number I had for Sylvia was her business number. She was a dentist and her married name was Han. So the receptionist said in Swedish, basically, doctor, this is Dr. Han's office. And I decided I better lay back a little bit. And I said, this is Dr. Long calling from Chapel Hill. It, can Dr. Han come to the phone? I thought if I make it sound like a business call, she's more likely to talk to me. And again, I'm speaking in English, but the, it sounds like the admin understands me. So the administrator says, I'll be right back. It's a very long two minutes. I hear footsteps. I hear some talking. And finally, I hear high heels coming back. And it's my cousin. So this is Dr. Han. And what do I do? I burst into tears. I can't even talk. I finally choke out, Sylvia, my name is Debbie. I'm your cousin from the United States. I've been looking for you for 50 years. Your mother was Rosemary. And she says, I know who you are. You're that woman who called my brother Yossi yesterday. <laughs> I said, yes. I said, you know, why didn't you call me back? She said, well, we didn't think you were quite right. <laughs> And I said, well, I can understand that, but let me tell you who I am. Let me explain the family tree. So, you know, we, we, you know, I, I calmed down a little bit. I was extremely excited, as you might imagine. And I said, why don't we Skype? Because that was the technology we had. And I will introduce you to my family and I will show you the family tree. So on the weekend, my husband and I are in front of our camera and Sylvia and her husband, my second cousins are in front of their camera. There's Sylvia, there's her husband, Zev. They're sitting on the sofa with their two children behind them. And we're talking, we're talking. I asked Sylvia, you know, why don't you look for me? She said, we thought everybody had died. That's what her mother had told her. Just the same thing my mother had believed as well. And when I saw, you know, I could tell that Zev was tall from his profile. I said, Sylvia, would you mind standing up? And she looked at me, but she stood up and she stood up. And she stood up, she's six feet tall. And I said, I know you're a Gallus. My mother said, all the Gallus people were like Amazons. All the men, all the women were tall. And then she, and then Sylvia had something for me as well. She showed me this tiny little photograph, almost as smaller than a cameo. And she said it was a picture of her father, Jacob, that her mother had kept in her curly hair when she was in the concentration camps all the years that she had been um, interned. So she had, Sylvia was lucky enough to have a picture of her, of her uh, grandfather as well. And of course, Eleanor and Michael were there, Sylvia and Zev's kids. I asked Sylvia, why did you name your young man Michael? And she said, it's funny that you ask because I just like the name, but when I named him Michael, my mother, Rose Marie, said to me, I had an uncle by that name. That uncle was my grandfather. And of course, I eventually got to meet Yossi, uh, Sylvia's brother. And I said, why didn't you call me back? He says, my older sister's a little bossy. She told me you were a crazy woman and not to call you. Well, once I knew I had people, I had to get on a plane. So the very next year, of course, I went to Sweden. I met Jacques. I met Jacques' daughter, Nomi, who's on the left. My daughter's in the middle. Of course, I made this a family trip. There's Eleanor again. I met some of the other related family. Again, all of these were Swedish family. Who knew? And I have tried to maintain this connection with the Swedes. It's been very difficult, as you, all of you know, uh, with the pandemic. But it turns out that Jacques' daughter, Nomi, is the one who really feels very close about family. She came to the United States, and we had a family with cousins back in May of 2017. There are the descendants, my side of the family, uh, Abraham Michael Gallus' descendants, and there's Nomi with uh, her first baby. She now has a second baby and her husband. Those are Jacob's descendants. The following year, more incredible luck. I found more cousins. You might remember again that I discovered when I went back to Budapest with Caress that I looked more closely at those monk names and Caress started to do some of uh, some um, 
And because Hungarians never move, once there's a, an ancestral home, they never sell it. I was able to find Magda's descendants living in the same home 70 years after the war. And I was fortunate to be able to reunite with them as well. That's been another remarkable experience. I found more cousins on the Dubzinski side by the name of Auerbach or Orbach. They're Canadian. Another phenomenal rabbit hole I went down was I discovered, remember I said I was going to find out what happened to everybody in the family tree, that the Gallus's oldest um, patriarch, Israel Morka, had a daughter who survived. She and her family went to Siberia during the war. There's the documents I had on them. And there is Sipora in the middle between her two grandparents. Pora survived in Siberia. She had a son there as well, who was part of the children of Tehran. Some of you might have read about that immigration story. There's her son who did survive. He made it to Israel when he was 12 years old. At 16, he joined the Palmach and he died at Gush Etzion during the Israeli War of Independence. Like many of these stories that I've pursued to the very end, they often have a tragic ending, but I'm glad to know their fates. Perhaps the most bittersweet discovery was what happened to my mother's middle brother. This was the brother that she felt the closest to, that she had some guilt feelings about, the one who was sent to Chenstehova, who she believed had died in Buchenwald. What I discovered by following the paper trail was that he did not die in Buchenwald. Quite to the contrary, he was on a death Area 44 to Theresienstadt, and I found a card that indicated he was released from Theresienstadt in May of 1945, and he registered himself in the very same town where I had been with Rainier at the Jewish Registration Center or the Jewish Community Center in Sela. There's his name. And I've been looking for him for the last 10 years, and I've been unsuccessful. I believe he was trying to get back to Lodge and something happened to him. If my mother were alive today, it would be difficult for me to tell her that in fact her brother, her beloved brother was alive at the end of the war. I don't know what I would be able to say to her. I've learned so much from this incredible adventure I've been on. As I said, my birthday is tomorrow. I had my family here yesterday. And I said, all I wanna do is talk to you about family stories. And I spread out these notebooks I have about my father and I have more back in Chapel Hill about my mother. I said, I just want to make sure that their legacy continues. If you decide to get your feet on the ground, I want you to remember and not underestimate the importance of just sheer luck, sheer mazel, sheer serendipity. I'm a very scheduled person, but I realize that sometimes on a trip, you have to go with the flow. So when your guide says, I have emotional GPS, just live with it, you know, go where your heart takes you, because sometimes that's the most remarkable part of your journey. I have an incredibly supportive family. They didn't want to go with me on any of the research. Um, as a matter of fact, some of this was deeply personal, and I wanted to be able to spend the time by myself, and I didn't want to feel like I was stopping other people from having fun. So I told the nieces and my daughter, we're not going to be going to shopping malls in Warsaw. We're going to be going to cemeteries, libraries, and archives. And they all said, have a good time, Aunt Debbie, which was just fine. Even my husband stayed home. He let me do what I needed to do because I needed that time to be very intense about this experience. I also would encourage you to be open to the possibility, possibilities that Paul can be extremely helpful, supportive, interested, ashamed, and willing to help you discover your past. They have a much harder time embracing their past than we do. So for them, uh, you know, they are overcoming quite a bit as well. I shared with Rainier that when I got to know him a little bit better, that I was very fearful of coming to Germany, that you know, a German man was going to pick me up and drive me to Bergen-Belsen. I said, that was kind of scary. He said, I was also very fearful. He said, many times Jewish families come to me and they ask for information and they're very angry with me. They're very mad at me. And he said, and I understand it. So he's, he's fighting battles on his side as well. And I'd also remind you to never forget your history. Um, chances are you're in my age cohort. If you don't write down your history, if you don't tape record it, all of that work that you've done is going to become lost. So write it down for the generations to come.
when my friends ask me, why do I keep doing all of this work on the Holocaust? Why do I teach it? Why do I talk about it? Why can't I get over it? Well, this is a little bit of an insensitive remark. You don't get over the Holocaust, but I do Kurzweil's passage because I think he says it best. He wrote, the Talmud says that when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, the survivors of that cataclysm had to say to themselves, what are we going to do? Is this the end or do we rebuild? The Talmud says that when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, then the Jews did their family trees. A commentator makes the observation that sometimes if you want to go forward, you first have to go backward. You see where you are coming from and you know where you are going. We are a rebuilding generation. We come after two of the worst moments of Jewish history. One, of course, the Holocaust, in which a third of our people were murdered, and two, the mass migration of Jews when our families were torn apart. There is probably not a Jewish family that if you go back two or three generations, you will not see that family torn apart. Brothers and sisters never saw each other again, husbands and wives, grandparents and grandchildren. The fact of six million Jews being killed during the Holocaust is quite unfathomable to us. Most people in the world don't know what quite to do with the Holocaust, but I think we genealogists have found out what to do with the Holocaust. We remember names. When the Nazis rounded us up, they took away our names and they gave us numbers. What we're involved with doing is taking away the numbers and giving them back their names. You've been a very gracious audience. And I want to thank you for honoring me by letting me tell you the story of my research, as well as some of um, my parents' stories. And it's good to be back in Chicago again to see your wonderful faces. Thank you again.